Uh, uh, in the participants, it says Francisco is the host. Francisco, would you mind clicking record? If you can. It shows it's recording for me. Okay, it's already, 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 already done. done. Ah, thank you, Francisco. So, as I was saying, uh, going to show you where, uh, what Gitly is, why we have it, why we've decided to extract it out into a microservice. Um, I'm going to show you a feature that I built and then uh, at last, I'm going to show the things that I've, uh, I've learned or that I've yeah, worked around and the things that I needed to do to be able to work comfortably on a, on a Gitly feature. So first of all, this is uh, where we were coming from. Um, we had uh, GitLab Rails running and uh, on, on a server, and then we would have several NFS mounts uh, on that server, and we would just talk through um, to Rugged to manipulate or read that repository. Uh, Rugged is a Ruby wrapper around libgit2, which is a C implementation of, uh, of Git. So we can, yeah, we could very quickly make operations on Git repositories through that. And this had several advantages because, well, the API of Rugged is very nice. We could easily make changes to repositories if the code was simple. Adding more storage was also simple because we could just if the one of the storage nodes ran out, we could just add another one, start storing stuff on a new disk, and uh, that that way we could keep scaling that in this direction. Um, we also had high availability because NFS offers that. Uh, for those of you that don't know, NFS means network attached storage. So there's another node with a lot of storage, and we would just share a folder kind of to the server and we would store the repositories there, uh, if that makes sense. Um, another thing that was uh, nice about this is that Rugged by itself ca caches uh, some things, which means that by using Rugged, we would uh, not need to open, uh, reopen the repository for each read or write that we did. Uh, this is the reason that some of our uh, big customers now needed to fall back to some of the rugged implementations uh, because Gitterly, the overhead that Gitterly introduced, uh, so there's a little bit of overhead for network calls, but there's also some overhead opening and closing the repositories. Uh, the main reason we wanted to get away from this model is that it was kind of incontrol incontrollable. If there were timeouts for the disk and so on, the whole system would just kind of stop and we couldn't really control that. So that's why we went to this kind of implementation. Uh, we have the, um, uh, the GitLab Rails application running on the same kind of server as it was before. And then we're talking to different servers who are running Gitterly uh, as an application. And that those disks are directly uh, mounted SSDs on those servers running Gitterly. So that means that we are going to talk from uh, the from the Rails application through a, a class called Gitterly client that talks uh, RPC to the Gitterly service. RPC stands for uh, remote procedure calls. Uh, it's kind of like an API. So that instead of counting on a file system, we would have a real API with the error handling that comes with it and so on. So our implementation would be more robust. If one of the uh, storage servers goes belly up, then all the repositories on that server would become inaccessible, but it wouldn't bring the whole system down. Um, yeah, obviously this implementation is more complex that, than what we used to have. And there's some overhead, as I mentioned, the network call and uh, op uh, opening and closing the repositories, which is something we're uh, working on right now. In reality, it kind of looks a little bit more complex because uh, we have several consumers using Gitterly. We have GitLab Rails. That's the, the one that we're going to be most interested in because as create developers, that's where most of our work happens. Uh, but there's also Workhorse and GitLab Shell that talk to uh, Gitterly. And even Gitterly itself talk to Gitterly. As I mentioned, um, the Gitterly process runs on a single storage node, but sometimes that would need 
uh, information from another Gitterly host, for example, when we're working across forks and so on. So then they would talk to each other, uh, fetching information. All of this happened uh, through a gRPC protocol defined, um, defined in our Gitterly proto um, repository. This is kind of like a, a contract that uh, all of the Gitterly consumers and servers talk. Um, it, we define And the protocol inside Prof would generate code that we can use across the different services. So for the GitLab Rails, it would generate a Ruby gem. Uh, for GitLab Ruby, it would also generate a Ruby gem. But we would have a, a Go package that we can talk to from all the Go code and so on. Um, oh, so this might all be a little bit much to take in, but I think it's much easier with a, a short example. So the example that I'm going to show is a feature I implemented a few months ago, and it allows users to email patches uh, as attachments to GitLab. GitLab will create a merge request, apply those patches to a branch, and uh, yeah, so that's what the feature is going to do. To uh, build this, we first, the first thing I did was think about, I'm going to start showing code. The first thing uh, we needed to think about was what are we actually going to change in the repository? So the first thing to start working on when you're uh, going to implement a feature that uh, touches Gitterly, that's going to modify or read from a repository, is thinking about the messages that we are going to send around. So the messages that we need here is um, we're going to send the patch to Gitly, apply it, and commit it as a as a certain user to a certain repository. So the endpoint that the uh, RPC, so the where we go, we are going to send the message to is this one. It's defined in the Gitly proto uh, repository that I just mentioned. So we're going to have we're going to have to add a, a method to the server, user reply patch that uh, gets a certain message. So we are going to send a message of the user reply patch request uh, format, and we're going to send back a user apply patch re request. L. I'm sorry, user apply patch response. To show you um, what these look like. These are the messages that we're actually going to send. This is the one that we're going to send and we're going to reply with uh, operation branch update response here. As you can see, this message consists of two parts. Um, this is because the header will contain the meta that is going to contain the user that's going to be committing the patches, the repository where we're going to do it, and the branch we're going to do it on. So that's the new branch uh, that we're going to be creating. And then it's going to um, contain all of the patch files. Um, we don't actually know how many patch files those are going to be and uh, how big they are going to be. So we need to uh, stream that response. That means we will send multiple messages with, we could be sending multiple messages with this um, part of the message filled in. That's because the message size of uh, the RPC calls is limited. If there's any questions about that, uh, feel free to interrupt me. So that's the easiest thing to start with, figuring out what you're going to do uh, inside the repository. And that's a small change that we can make and we can get the people, the maintainers of Gitly involved and have them review this, see if there's any spots you missed, any more data you might need for your call. It's a, they're always very, con Same changes and they allow you to think about what's going to happen first. That's why I think it's a good idea to start with the, the Gitterly Protos stuff. Bob, can, can you explain about the stream uh, thing uh, on the method declaration there? Is it because uh, you are going to have like multiple messages or? Um, ah, yes. No, we are going to, so then you mean in the, uh,
uh, you mean this kind of stream? Yes. Yes. So that's here because uh, we're going to, we don't know, how, the message size uh, is limited. So we can't uh, send, we can't be sure that we can send all of the patches that the user uploaded in one single RPC message. That's why um, we're going to split it up in two parts. One is the header, that's just the metadata, and we know for sure that's going to fit in a single message. Then the next messages are going to contain the actual patches, and we're going to keep looping through them and splitting them up into the bytes that fit in one message to um, send it off to Gitly. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, just for completeness, can you uh, give us a hint of how we figure out if it's too big or not? Um, if it's uh, user provided, then probably you should take care that it can be bigger than a message size. If it's limited, like the, the, the data that we're sending here inside the header. Uh, this kind of data is, um, yeah, it, it's kind of limited. The thing that might be worrisome is, for example, the, the target branch here. Maybe somebody could think of a branch that's way too long, um, but I don't think that's a risk. But in this part of the, the message, the patches part, we can't guess how big those are going to be. They're going, they could be megabytes long. And I don't remember the, the maximum message size of the... Um, it's about one megabyte. And we try, to stay, we try to stay well below one megabyte, like more in the order of 100 kilobytes max or less. Yeah, so... Do we, do we apply a limit to the branch size in the in code? Do we have a, a, a branches, um, do they have a, a fixed maximum length? Um, they are limited by the file system mostly. Like, uh, try to create a, on the Mac. Try to create a branch with what was it, Jakob? Longer than two hundred something characters? Was it even more? Like, because those are file names, and uh, uh, file system isn't happy if you create paths that are too long. So it's going to be uh, limited to that. Yeah. And so with br with branches, we usually just let Git blow up on them, so we don't. Have to set a hard limit. We could we could say a branch is not allowed to be longer than X, but uh, it it becomes a problem way before we hit the maximum message size. What do you mean, Christopher? Uh, what happens when there's no host? Oh, sorry, that was uh, about the recording of the session. Please continue, Bob. Like that's a ah, side side thing. Sorry. <laughs> um. So where were we? Ah, yes, the, the message size. Well, so if we suspect that it could be bigger than one megabyte, then we are going to separate it off into multiple messages. Thank you for that, Jakob. So this uh, protocol is the first thing I suggested to the, to the Gitly team. They picked up on it. We were discussing in the merge request what we're going to do with it. They agreed with me that this would fit the requirements. So that got merged first, that got merged which meant that I had a new gem to include and a new uh, Go package that I could use for developing the feature on the Ruby side and on the uh, Go's, on the Gitly side itself. Um, so let's walk through what happens on the GitLab Excuse Rails. Me, can, I, can I ask a question before you move on? Uh, yes, of course. In the previous code, uh, are those numbers like, uh, Repository one, user two, target Thank point. you very much for bringing that up. I meant to talk about that, but I forgot it. I forgot it during my practice run as well. So we give a name to and an index to those uh, messages so the protocol can um, assign them to fields. We cannot, uh, because of backwards compatibility, we cannot reuse those numbers. Like for example, here, we used to have a field that was called pre-receive error and had an index of two. two keep old servers and old clients happy, like for example, an old client would still set this field, um, we cannot reuse those. Does that make sense? The and name so that we use, the so name. Numbers, they are just mapping to. Yes, they're the location of the, uh, 
of the field in the message. It, it's, a, it's a size trick. If you think of how big JSON messages are. In JSON messages, you waste a lot of space uh, repeating the keys in every message. And this is protobuf, which is designed to be a more space efficient encoding. So yeah. instead of writing out a key as an ASCII string, there will be a small binary integer, uh, one, two, three, which indicates the field. Yeah, perfect. And, and then the name is only used um, for ways of accessing those fields. Um, anything else around the protocol? Okay, so let's see how this is implemented on the on the GitLab Rails site. I'm not going to go too deep into this, but uh, this class just receives the the email and it checks if there's any patches in the attachments. If there are, are we're going to um, apply those patches to the source branch. So we're doing that through uh, like that kind of a common pattern in our code base. In our code base, there's a, a service that we pass a project, the user, and then whatever information that needs that it needs to do what it does. So here's this service. Um, it's just going to um, perform some validations, seeing if the if the um, the patches aren't too big, this kind of stuff, and then it's going to call out into a piece of code that lives inside GitLab Git. All the code that lives in GitLab Git is the code that is going to call out to Gitly client, which is going to call out to um, Gitly itself. So here's the, um, uh, the code that is actually going to uh, call out to Gitly client. Um, what this class mainly does is um, knowing where to call uh, which Gitly client to call, which uh, RPC it's going to have to call. And then it's going to wrap the errors that, the RPC errors that could be thrown into something that's more meaningful for the GitLab application. For example, a gRPC not found would be wrapped into a no repository error, which is more meaningful on this side. Um, this is going to call out into the um, Gitly operation client and this, is this uh, service and um, yeah, this class. Um, the main responsibility of this class is to uh, wrap the Ruby object we built before uh, into what will be the, the messages sent to Gitly over the, the gRPC call. As you can see here, the header is just a fixed one. And then here we're building a, different chunks of the patches and that's just going to be this binary IO. Does that make sense? When the request is entirely built, we're calling out to uh, Gitly here and we're going to expect a response back in um, a certain format. Uh, in this case, that's the, um, what's it called again? The branch update operation, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. So we parse that here and we pass it back to everything that needs to do cache and validation and so on. So this gets uh, passed off to Gitly and um, according to our uh, protocol, which we were just looking at, this would end up, where's my other window here? Inside the applied patch um, in the operation service as you seen here, we were working on the operations proto and the operations package that we have here implements all the methods that are defined in this, in this, proto in this protocol. So the one we're interested in now is the uh, applied patch one. Um, first of all, this is a decision I, I made. We could have um, passed it on immediately, but right now uh, we're validating the header of the request inside Go. So this, we're receiving the stream, we're getting the header, and then uh, we're just checking if everything's present and we return early if, if it's not. 
uh, sorry, that's here. If everything's fine, then uh, we're going to pass this off to Gitali Ruby. Gitali Ruby is um, like an, another RPC service that um, has some of our old rugged code, older rugged code, and um, Ruby methods that read and write to the repository. Um, the reason I am calling into uh, Gitali Ruby here is that there's a bunch of helpers there already that will execute uh, the git hooks, the, what is it, the pre-receive and so on, that we want to execute when we're pushing a new branch, stuff like that. So what we're doing here is just uh, getting everything to uh, call out to Gitly Ruby, setting the headers again on the request, and then just proxying the, um, the rest of the, of the request to um, to Gitly Ruby, Gitly Ruby itself um, implements the same uh, interface as we've defined in the protocol. So uh, we would have an operations. Uh, no. Uh, Gitly server operation service, and this is the one that's going to be. Uh, receiving the request that we just sent from Gitly Go to Gitly Ruby. So here's where the request comes in. Again, we kind of um, read the request and map everything into uh, Ruby objects that we can reason about and we pass it off into a class that's going to do the actual thing we want to do. That's the class that we're interested in. Um, similar to what we have on the, in GitLab Rails, there's a repository class who's going to perform the actual commit. But the reason uh, I wanted to bring this up is this operation service singular. That's a little bit confusing, but that's the class, maybe not split. Um, that's going to perform this update branch uh, with hooks. That's the, um, uh, that's the, sorry, I was distracted by the, by the chat, Alexander. Um, I think, uh, how is the load on this RPC call handled is the question. Um, what do you mean by load? Can you? Yeah, hi. Uh, so like, obviously like we have multiple users, there will be a lot of calls. Do we have some, some sort of like proxying or like load balancing or proxying like in front of these services? Uh, or, or, or how is that handled? How, how these, all of the requests are queued in some way or? Um, as far as I know, not all of the Gitly requests go to a single node. Like each repository is stored on a certain node. So each node only needs to deal with the request. Uh, right, but there, 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 there can still happen like a lot of requests in the same time, like in, in parallel, right? So there, there has to be like some sort of um, I can answer, I can. boundaries. Andrew, I would love for you to answer that. <laughs> so uh, remember, Alexandria, that most of the requests are um, handled in, in O, right? And so the vast majority of the, of the requests don't go through to Gidley Ruby. Um, and, and nearly all of those are just handled with no sort of concurrency limits. Um, so at any one stage, I think at the moment, we have about 2,500 requests going to Giddly a, a second, I think so, it is. So, so it will start the process for every request? Or? No. Pretty much. Uh, it, it, for, for, most of the, for, for most requests, it, it, it will start a Git, a Git process. Um, now remember that there's 35 Git shards at the moment, right? So every now and again, we'll add some more. Like when we started off with Gitly, there was maybe 18 shards and now we've got about 35 shards. And whenever those machines get full, we, we add some more shards. And so we can horizontally shard it like that. Um, for certain, so there's, there's, a, there's a small subset of requests that are kind of considered um, dangerous if you want. And those requests have got something on them called concurrency limits. And, and what that, do, or concurrency limiter. And what that does is for, um, any particular repository for those requests, there's only a certain number that can happen at one time. 
and the rest of them queue, but that's not the default. So one of the, the RPC methods that we use that for is called uh, get archive. And what it, what it does is it creates a tarball of the entire Git repository and then sends that through to the client. And so if you spin up a hundred requests to get that concurrently, it could, it could damage the server quite drastically. And so what we do is we, we intercept that and we say, no, if you want that, you're gonna have to wait. Um, but for 99% of the requests, we don't do that because it's not necessary. Okay, okay. I'm just wondering, like, like uh, it may happen that one, one repository is more active than the other. So on a, on a specific server or in a specific shard, there will be a lot of these requests, calls to the, uh, to the uh, um, services, yeah. like the DRPCs and so on. So I'm just wondering if we... Um, do have a, 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 a like we you know what we do is we kind of try to balance things out a little bit and move things around between the shards if there's a particularly noisy repository oh, so, so we'd move a repository to a different shard that, that's like yeah, less active we, or something? Have, uh, we have done that like um you know three of the busiest repositories for Giddily are surprisingly GitLab CE, GitLab EE, and about uh, www.gitlab.com. And luckily those are on three different servers because if we put them all on the same server, it would put a lot of load on those servers. But, but actually what you find is at any stage, there's about four servers that are getting new repositories. And then the rest of the servers, so what's that at the moment, like 29 servers or whatever it is, don't get new repositories. And if you look at the load, those ones always have much higher load and the rest of them, it sort of quietens down a little bit. Cool. Matt, thank you. Matt asks if uh, every um, Gitly shard is a singleton. And uh, as far as I know, yes, for now it is. So each uh, shard has one disk with a certain set of repositories and we keep track of which shard, which repository is on. Andrew, you can correct me there if I'm wrong. That's exactly what. That's exactly right. And I don't know if some of the Giddly people on here, but there's a there's a piece of work called Giddly HA, and one of the things that will come out of Giddly HA is that we will have, you know, multiple um, copies of of each shard. But at the moment, it's a single shard. So for machine reboots, a subset of the repositories will or request to those repositories will fail during that reboot. But um, luckily, it's generally pretty stable. Um, what's also interesting is, um, as I mentioned, for some requests, uh, mainly writes, we have this um, uh, second Gitly process that's running on the Gitly service as well, called Gitly Ruby. Um, that's obviously much slower than the Go implementations of stuff, but it contains a bunch of code and it's using Rugged, which is pretty handy to uh, like it has a pretty handy API to write to a repository and so on, which is what we're doing here. Um, mainly this updating the branch with hooks is going to call out, uh, it's going to run the git hooks, which is the, I forget now, pre-receive, update and post-receive, I think. Um, we want to do that uh, for each, um, for each operation that updates the repository. And we already had that implemented in Ruby. Because this, the, the writes are not as high traffic as the reads, there wasn't really much reason to rewrite all of that in Go, which is why we're using Gitly Ruby uh, for this RPC as well. So as you can see, uh, it just calls out to the repository. It's going to perform the commit patches, which in this case is going to be uh, just um, calling of uh, git a n. Um, we set, we pass the, the user that's going to uh, perform the commits. Remember, we're using patches here, so the author of the patch is inside of the patch, but we're committing that as the user that sent the email using the token that we got from the other side from, from GitLab Rails. That's passed inside the, the environment here. And we just run a git am the way you would apply a patch locally. Uh, and then afterwards, we uh, read parse to be able to send back the branch update request containing the new revision and so on to update the caches back on the on the GitLab Rails site. Uh, the GitLab Rails site. 
Uh, Matt asks if the, what the relationship is between Gitly Ruby and Gitly Golang. Was the Go implementation a rewrite of the Ruby implementation? So um, as far as I know, when we were implementing Gitly, we were uh, implementing a bunch of RPCs and rewriting them uh, into Go. Especially we started with the high, uh, the high traffic ones and those would perform much better in Go. We try to map one um, get like one operation, one read to one RPC call. Um, but yeah, that all hasn't always worked, which is why sometimes that we have problems of performing way too many uh, get to the calls inside a single request. Uh, Andrew, you were going to say something? Yeah, just to give a little bit more color to, to that answer. Like the original intention was that the entire, everything was going to be written in Go. And then as we went along, we realized that like there's a lot of code that is, um, you know, it's really old. Like it's, it's some of the original rugged code that went into GitLab. Um, and there's a lot of really weird edge conditions and, and rewriting that in Go would be incredibly complicated and there's not enough test cases. And so at that point we realized in order to speed things up, we would just leave those in, in Ruby. And, and that's sort of where Gitly Ruby came from. But, you know, that stuff, that long tail of things, I don't think will ever go away um, because there's no point in, in, in moving them across. There's not a lot of value in, in moving that to go. Since the, the amount of requests that are doing these writes, since it's mostly writes going through Gitly Ruby, the, there's not a, a lot of performance to be gained there as well. And as I mentioned, the API for uh, the, the rugged API, like for, for us to use, is pretty nice. So I'm kind of happy that it's still there for some cases as well. Um, as Andrew mentioned that at some point we just copied all the code over. That's also why you will see a lot of similar namespaces here and so on. Um, can be a little bit confusing, like the operation and operations service. Uh, the operations plural is the RPC, like the implementation of all the different RPC calls uh, defined in the operations.proto and operation service is something that comes over from GitLab Rails that would perform a thing on a repository as a user, if that makes sense. And I think Jakob can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but that's how I understood it. Yeah, um, it's it's a bunch of weird, um, lots of Gitly Ruby is just a bunch of weird code that we literally vendored from GitLab Rails uh, to get it across the, the way exactly exactly the way it used to work. So uh, that's roughly how that particular feature works. Um, hold on, there's two more questions. Uh, are RPC calls vulnerable to security attacks? What has been done to tighten up the security? So the RPCs themselves are not open to the public, but um, the source code is. So they're uh, like you can manipulate so you can um, yeah, expose vulnerabilities like that. Sometimes we shell out to, to Git like we did for this particular uh, call. Uh, where's the file? Here, this is things that we are shelling out to Git. So there is some danger in that, but Gitly is supposed to be a safer way of working with Git than just shelling out to Git directly. And I think I read that from Jakob somewhere in the merge request. <laughs> And I thought it was nicely said. Um, what have we done to tighten up security? Um, we, I don't know anything in well, particular, Jakob. Yeah, well, one of the obvious uh, problems is uh, argument injection on commands because we spawn lots of Git commands. So uh, we try to have sane abstractions where certain things can go wrong, but uh, it's, there's no golden bullet there. It's it's an ongoing. It's something we can still get better at. But as much as possible, we just try to create safe abstractions so that certain types of security errors uh, won't happen. It's not perfect, but. Uh, Matt asks, do the clients know which operations to send to Go and uh, which ones to send to Ruby? Or are all operations routed to Ruby and some pass through Go? It's actually the other way around. So all operations arrive first at uh, Gitly, the Go implementation. And for some uh, operations, these writes will be passed on like proxy to Gitly Ruby running on the same host. So 
So actually, I have a question about uh, when we add a new RPC code to uh, Gitterly. Uh, <clears throat> like you said, um, Gitterly playlist has some functions, uh, like all the functions. And uh, when we add a new JRCB call, should we add Gitter, uh, should we add a method in Gitterly Relus to or just we add in Gitterly Go only? Um, it depends what you're implementing. And that brings me kind of nicely to, to my uh, last slide here. Um, lots of stuff already exists in Gitterly, so there's no need to reinvent the wheel. For example, the operation service that I just showed. Uh, which will trigger the, the hooks that we want to call for a user operation. If you were to implement a, a, a new RPC that needs to write to repository as a user, I would recommend using that service and not re-implementing it entirely in Go. But if you're doing something that uh, has none of the existing things related to it, then by all means, only do it in Go. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, that's uh, kind of the, some takeaways that I wanted to uh, leave you all with. Kitaly does a lot already, and we need to be careful uh, to, like, it's not because Kitaly already does something that we should uh, call three different RPCs right next to each other in a single request. If that's going to be a high traffic thing, it might be better to implement that as a new RPC. Um, there's a trick uh, that I linked here that you can use in specs to see how many uh, calls you're making to Gitterly and if that doesn't exceed a certain number. Um, if you add resources, for example, the same way we try to limit uh, the amount of requests, uh, the amount of queries we send to the database. Um, I also noticed that trying to work outside of the Go path is just a, well, it's more complicated than it needs to be, so don't. I, I decided not to do it. Um, there's some uh, tips I wanted to leave you with on how to use a local Gitly instance. Um, I personally have uh, symlinked my GDK Gitly instance to the one in my Go path, um, so I can use that one instead. Mm, GDK will also keep it up to date and so on if you wanted to do that. Um, when you uh, update the Gitterly Proto, as I shown you before, you can vendor it before it's merged as well, uh, or you can point your uh, gem file to your specific branch, and then you can already start work even before uh, the protocol changes have been updated. Uh, regarding the test, um, I try to, like for this particular feature, it was very handy to just generate some patch files and then uh, have a high level test in GitLab Rails, sort of um, an integration test that would validate that they get properly applied. But we could, like, you should also be testing all the units along the line. For example, as you've seen in my example here, there was some validation happening on the Go side and then the application on the application of the patch on the, in Gitterly Ruby. So both of those are tested separate, separately and there's an integration test on top of the, on top of everything in GitLab Rails since we spin up, uh, since we spin up um, a Gitterly process for tests anyway. Uh, furthermore, the people in the key underscore Gitterly Slack channel are super helpful. So if you're building something and you get stuck, feel free to reach out to them. And that's, uh, yeah, that's my main takeaways. Are there any more questions? Okay, so thank you very much, everyone. And talk to you all later. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bob. That was awesome. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks.